Welcome everybody. I'm Pastor Chris King with Northbridge Church in Frisco, Texas. And I want to welcome you this morning to this virtual experience in this live stream. Now, for Northbridge Church, we are here for those who are looking for more. By more, we mean more love, more truth, more transformation, and more success. But we don't define success by the way the world defines it. We define it how God defines it being productive for the kingdom of God, living according to your purpose. So we just want to say welcome, and I pray that you get some nuggets in today's message that will help you transform your life. Now, at Northbridge Church, we want you to be able to get your questions answered. So as you listen to the message, write down your questions, and feel free, text your question to 972-787-1761. That's 972-787-1761. And I will answer your questions following the message. Thank you again and enjoy. We would like to thank you for supporting our ministry and allowing us to share the word of God with you. Today, we invite you to become a partner in ministry with us. For your gift of $50 or more, we will send you a signed copy of Pastor Chris's amazing book, Black Jesus, White Jesus, A Search for a Colorless Christ. This book is a timeless exploration of Pastor Chris's personal journey of race and faith. Again, we thank you for becoming a partner today, and we look forward to continuing to share God's word with you. Good morning, good morning, good morning. This is Pastor Chris King from Northbridge Church here in Frisco, Texas, and I just want to say welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm excited to have you here with me this morning or whenever you've decided to actually partake of this message. So I just want to thank you for engaging this time, and I am excited about this word as we are rounding out the series titled Living the Chosen Life, Living the Chosen Life. And so you guys know how it is. It doesn't make any sense for me to come up here and teach the word if you're not ready to receive the word. So I'm going to ask you if you're ready to receive the word, and I want you to say, yeah, through all caps, emojis, pictures, gifts, all that other good stuff. Also, if you can sing and dance, do it in your house, and that's okay. You can actually do it on TikTok and say, yeah, Pastor Chris, I'm ready to receive the word. All right. Y'all ready to receive the word? Say, yeah. Y'all ready to receive the word? Say, oh, yeah. All right. Good deal. Father God, we honor you. Thank you so much, oh God, for this opportunity to share the word with the people, with the saints. Oh God, Father, let us not just be hearers of the word, but doers of the word, oh God, so that we can transform our lives transforms our families, our communities, our nation, and our world. In the name of Jesus, amen. <clears throat> so, we are rounding out this series titled Living the Chosen Life. The Bible talks about many are called, but few are chosen. And so we've gone through over the past several weeks just laying out, first establishing a foundation on what that means, and then giving you an understanding of the various different calls that even the scripture talks about. And we've used the scripture and I've detailed that, what those calls look like, what's happening in the midst of those calls, and what, uh, what you're supposed to do in regards to your responsibility during those calls. So we're going to be talking about where... I ought to be this morning where I ought to be. And so we're going to go to the book of Hebrews, chapter 5, verses 12 through 14. Okay, now somebody just told me a joke right before this time. They said, the Bible says that women ain't supposed to brew coffee. Women ain't supposed to make coffee because he brews. All right, all right. Now, it wasn't my joke. Okay, I'm not going to take credit for it, okay? But somebody just told me that joke, but I told them the scripture. Okay, they said, women ain't supposed to make coffee because Hebrews. All right, let's go. All right, Hebrews chapter 5, verses 12 through 14. They're sitting here just laughing at me right now, and because I'm that crazy to actually repeat that. All right, <laughs> okay, Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12 through 14. Really read this passage of scripture, because this passage of scripture is really critical when it's coming, talking about the foundational uh, principles of our faith and going into even Hebrews chapter 6, okay? So this, this passage of scripture sets up our understanding of the foundational principles of our faith. So please read, read Hebrews chapter 5, verses 12 to 14, and then travel in and go ahead and go into verse uh, ch chapter 6, the very next chapter right after this, and then read uh, starting with uh, verse 1 there. So Hebrews chapter 5, verses 12 through 14, here, the writer of Hebrews is talking about spiritual maturity. 
And so when I think about spiritual maturity, you know, I just think about things in my life and, you know, the different periods in my life. And as I've gotten older, there has always come a time, uh, well, well, several times, there have been several times throughout my life, and I'm sure in someone else in your life, where you may make an evaluation. And sometimes this, this evaluation comes every year, right? You know, some people make New Year's resolutions or goals, and then at the end of the year, they may evaluate how they performed against those goals. Um, in our jobs, we actually have continuous evaluations. If you're in a sales job, oftentimes you're uh, measured based off of quarterly or monthly performance, right? And so there's an evaluation there. Sometimes in our organizations, we do periodic evaluations, whether it's a mid-year evaluation or end-of-the-year evaluation. There's always a time in someone's life where there's an evaluation on when, where you should be at versus where you are. And so in my life, there have been several times where I have gone through this personal evaluation of where I was versus where I wanted to be. Okay. When I was uh, 18, there was an evaluation that I did when I was graduating from high school. Okay. Um, when I was, when I turned 21, there was an evaluation that I did. Um, that evaluation was, was, you know, was different than when I was 30, when I hit 30 or, uh, when I hit 35 or 40. Okay. And I'll stop there. All right. Um, you know, cause now there's an evaluation almost daily as I am in my forties. And that evaluation is, okay, do I want to get out of bed? How bad is my body hurting right now? And how bad is it going to hurt after I do what I'm supposed to do today? So, you know, there are different evaluations throughout the life. But here, when I was younger, I had my life all planned out. You know, I was going to do this. I was going to do that. I, you know, uh, in my mind, you know, by age 35, I was going to retire as a multimillionaire. Okay, that was it, you know, and I was just going to be living it up on a yacht in the French Riviera. I was just going to be a millionaire and that's it. I didn't know how, I didn't know why, that was just it, you know, and I had even, you know, told people, I said, hey man, by 35, I'm just going to be a millionaire. I'm just going to be French Riviera. And, I, and, you know, to be honest with you, I don't even know where the French Riviera is, but I, that was my goal and that was, that was my mark of where I was uh, evaluating myself. Okay. And in that evaluation, of course, when I came to 30, you know, I realized that it wasn't really going to happen like that. Right. But in between the, from the time that I started with that goal and realizing at 30, that it probably wasn't going to happen like that. I had spent so much energy trying to achieve that goal of retiring and just doing nothing, just living off of interest money, you know, just living off of, of money that I had made by 35. And I had invested in certain things. I had invested in courses. I'd gone to seminars, conferences. I had paid for coaching, mentoring, all this, trying to pursue this goal of retiring as a multimillionaire by the age of 35. And so uh, when I was 30, though, I did an evaluation. You know, 30 is one of those ages where you look at your life and stuff starts getting real. 20 is in your play, your play time, right? You start playing and, and you're playing all the time and you're not really taking life as seriously. You think you got forever in your 20s and your 30s is like, okay, you know, uh, I need to start getting serious. When you hit your 40s, there's a switch that says, okay, I ain't for no foolishness anymore because I don't have that much time. So in my 30, at 30, I had evaluated my, my life according to the goal and the plan that I had laid out. I said, this probably won't happen like this because at 30 years old, I was at the lowest point at that, you know, so far of my life. I was a divorcee and I, I had a child and I had lost everything that I had owned and I was living in my car. I was living out of my car, you know, and you know, a car that I really couldn't pay for that, you know, good thing I was living out of because I could move around and they couldn't catch me in it to take it away. I was just at my lowest point. So my goal of retiring by 35 as a multimillionaire, it was, you know, that window of opportunity was shrinking. And so I realized that at that time where I was didn't align 
with where I wanted to be. Some people right now are going through that period to where where you are now, it doesn't align with where you want to be. <clears throat> okay, and that is a tough thing to reconcile in your mind. You know, where am I now? Is it where I want to be? Nope. How far off am I? Oh, I'm a long ways off. Oh, man, I'm talking about being a multimillionaire and I don't have two pennies to rub, a, rub together. So now I'm so far off. And that realization rocked me. And so what did I do? I made new plans to achieve the same goal, <laughs> okay, to achieve the same goal. And then what happened? Life happened. Something else happened. And where I did, uh, you know, where I was didn't align with where I wanted to be then. And what did I do? I made new plans to achieve the same goal. And until life happened and it just became a vicious cycle of me trying to achieve the same goal, but life happening and I never got there and it was just a vicious cycle and I wasn't able to break the cycle and until I entered another variable into the mix. So here I'm battling with where I am versus where I want to be. And then I'm like, okay, well, there's something else. Where should I be, right? Where I ought to be, right? Here in this passage of scripture, the book of Hebrews, right? The book of Hebrews, this passage of scripture is talking about spiritual maturity. And then, you know, just to give you a lesson, the title of this book, it indicates the audience that it's talking to. OK, that it's written for. OK, um, you know, the book of Hebrews, it's written to uh, to address Jewish Christians, OK, who were Christian by faith, but Jewish by culture, Christian by faith, but Jewish uh, by by tradition. Christian, they, they were believers. You know, they they they're written for those Jewish believers that had a hard time continuing on in their faith. OK, and having a hard time believing in that because by now. Christians, they were already being persecuted by Jews, okay? So they were being persecuted for more than 30 years now at the time of this, this, this author, uh, the, the author writes Hebrews. And so they're already persecuted by about 30 years now. But what happens, the tests of persecution were getting old, but what happens is now you have Nero coming in as the leader and Nero now stepped it up by 10 times as much. He wasn't just persecuting the, 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 the Christians. He was like persecuting. He was like after them. He was on them. He was just like going after them just 10 times as much as what they were accustomed to. So the now the kitchen is getting hot. The fire is getting hotter. And people now are saying, is it worth it? I understand we were supposed, we wanted to be here, but now life is happening. Something is happening. And now something, I don't know. I don't want to do this anymore. I I want to go back to what I'm comfortable with. I want to go back to what, what I'm accustomed to. I want to go to where it's easier. Okay. Have you ever been in a position where you started down one track and life started happening and the frustration from life now makes you turn around, make you do a U-turn and be like, no, okay, I had it wrong. This is not what God said, okay? If God said to do this, he surely would have made it easier. No, see, see, we start to think like that. And so here, the writer of Hebrews is talking to these particular believers and he's saying, you know, what, you know, by now, by this time, through all of your experiences, through all of the teaching, through all of the praying, through all of the, the things that we've gone through, you ought to be teachers. He says, for now, for by this time, you ought to be teachers. Where you ought to be is teaching. And he's, he's saying this not as a desired characteristic. See, for me, my goal at 35 was to retire as a millionaire. That was a desired characteristic. That was one of my whims, one of my desires. That was a wish. That was a dream of mine. That was a desired characteristic. But he's not talking about a desired characteristic. He's talking about obligation. He says, by now, you are obligated to teach others. You are obligated to do this. This is your responsibility. 
He's like, you're letting all of this other stuff take you away from your responsibilities. He's saying previously in the series, we talked about commitment okay, versus connection. He's saying, okay, okay, okay. Now you're letting life get in the way of even your commitment. Okay, he's saying your connection has faltered, but now you're even letting life get in the way of your commitment. He's like, okay, we, 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 because by now you ought to be teaching, teaching somebody how to get over the tough times. You ought to be teaching somebody how to persevere. You ought to be teaching somebody how to pursue God and how to actually demonstrate the love of God despite the social circumstance or the cultural calamities. You ought to be teaching this stuff by demonstrating it and explaining it and being a person of principle and character. You ought to be. It's your obligation. It's your responsibility. This is your right. You got to you got to do this. He's like, so by now you ought to be teachers. So he is contrasting their desire for comfort with where they ought to be. He said, so there is a, I told you where I am, there's where I am versus where I want to be. And then that's versus where I ought to be. See, where I am is different from where I want to be, okay? And where I want to be is often different from where I ought to be, okay? So there's a difference here. There's some contrast here that we're looking. So he's saying, by now you ought to be teachers. You have an obligation. This is your responsibility. Then he's talking about in verse 13, he uses the word unskilled, okay? Meaning that you're unskilled, inexperienced, Okay, inexperience. You've not been tried. You've not been tested. Okay? So, so here it's like you, you're inexperienced here. It's not, it's, he's not saying you're not knowledgeable. Okay, you, he's not saying you're unaware. Okay, see, awareness of a thing does not necessarily mean experience in a thing. Many people have read books. Many people have been made aware of certain things, but they still lack the experience. Many people will sit here and teach you about what they heard about faith or what they heard about God or what they heard about Christ, but they are inexperienced. And as we talked about last time, they lack a connection. And so therefore they're inexperienced and not try. So what they're talking about hadn't been proven. And I made myself a vow a long time ago. I won't teach. I won't preach anything that I am not walking in that I am inexperienced in. See, so many people will give you theoretical definitions. They will talk the theology, but their theology has not been made practical. It has not been made a part of their life. So therefore, when you talk theology, that's all it's all they have. They're talking ideology. They're talking theology. They're just talking just concepts. They're not talking anything that's tried and true. And therefore, when you hang your hat on ideas, then therefore the ideas don't become ideals. And when they're not ideals and standards of your life, life, you're now not recognizing the transformation that you're seeking and you're left empty. I want to understand not just what the word of God is saying, but I'm trying to apply it to my life so I can see movement and growth. This passage is talking about growth. So when we're talking about living the chosen life, there has to be a focus to growth and commitment to growth. And you're committing to growth based on the connection that you have established. So we're seeing, he's saying, God's word requires more than just mm, a man nodding, hand raised, shouting, teach pastor. It requires more than that. It requires application. It requires more than just agreement. It requires application. The way you show your agreement with God's word is you apply God's word and live God's word. So here, the, ultimately, the writer of Hebrews is telling the people that by now you should be at a place of productivity. That's what he's saying. You should be producers and not just consumers. You should be making disciples. That's what you should be doing. This text is about maturity. And so we see 
a couple of lessons in this text as it pertained to living the chosen life. Number one, first thing that we recognize here is that you will never mature past your point of application. You'll never mature past your point of application. Like I said before, there are many people that talk a great game. There are many people that can tell you and can quote the scripture, but do not apply it. There are many people that don't, don't even understand it enough to apply it. This is why we give you weekly challenges that's based on what we're teaching so that you can take what we teach and therefore apply it to your life application now is the key you've got to be tried in it you've got to be experienced in it because you'll never mature past your point of application once you stop applying the word of god to your life you can keep on reading it all day long but once you stop applying the word of god to your life you'll stop growing right there and many people as the scripture says it's like you're inexperienced he says you need someone to teach you again the first principles, the elementary principles. It's saying the elementary principles of the oracles of God. The elementary. This is like kindergarten stuff. He's like, you need somebody to teach you again kindergarten. Can you imagine going through middle school, high school, college? You got a degree. Some of you have graduate degrees. Some of you even have PhDs. At the height of your education and being told, that you don't know Jack, you've done all of that, and you still need to go back to kindergarten. Finger painting, breaking graham crackers on the dotted line. That's where, where you are after all of that. It's like, that's still where some of us are after so many years of being inundated with the word of God and being in the vicinity of the presence of God. We still are at the elementary level. And so, we won't ever mature past our point of application. We have to understand that progression is not really about how many facts we can learn and how many you know, stats or scriptures we can regurgitate uh, at a particular time. It is about when you demonstrate an understanding through the application of the word of God. Okay, that's where progression takes place. This is why in school, students are given a test because although you've been given the information, can you put the information into practice? Can you demonstrate a knowledge and an understanding to the point to where you can actually be tried and tested and pass the test? Many of us have not passed the test because we know the cliches, we know the scripture, but we don't know how to apply them. Okay, so here... The Jewish Christians in, 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 in the book of Hebrews, they weren't demonstrating their ability to grow because they never learned how to apply the, that which they were taught. Remember, a lot of faiths, they require you to learn a lot and do a lot of traditions and practices on a regular schedule, on a regular basis. Do this, do this, do this, do this. We have our celebrations, we have our feasts, we have our, our fasts, we have all of these different things. We have these specific times for, for, for this, the prayer, and, and all that is cool. But there has to be an understanding to the point of application. And you can never grow past your point of application. You know, So here, with the Jewish Christians, it wasn't necessarily that they really didn't apply the word of God. It has to do more about not what you believe, but what you don't believe, right? If you can't apply the word of God, it's, it, signif it, it, it signals that not necessarily that you believe the word of God, but we, we have to ask, do you really believe the word of God if you know the word of God, right? So if you know the word of God, well, how come you can't apply it? You must not believe it. So it's more about your unbelief. You know, for many people, Excuse me. For many people, your unbelief far outweighs your belief. You know, when we see the scripture, uh, we, we see where Jesus was 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 right before Jesus was about to heal a demon possessed boy. Jesus tells his father, he says, yeah, yeah, all is possible for him who believe. And and he said, uh, I do believe, but help my unbelief for so many of us our unbelief outweighs our belief in what God is saying. And so therefore, since our unbelief outweighs our belief, it's more comfortable for you to return to the ways. It's more comfortable for you to return to the habits and the tendencies that you were once accustomed to and, and, and used to doing. And as the writer of Hebrews is, is stating it and putting it, he's saying that once you return to the old, now you're disappointed because 
uh, what you were looking for, it no longer exists in the matter that you knew it. It no longer exists in what you needed, what it used to provide you. That's because you've been exposed. You've been given a glimpse of what God can do, but you return to something that's older and the old ways, and it doesn't really do it for you anymore. Have you ever tried to exit the, oh man, <laughs> have you ever tried to exit the game, what we call the game, the dating game? Right. You exit the dating game. You're in a relationship now and now you're rocking and rolling and you've been in a relationship for years. And then all of a sudden the relationship ends and now you got to get back to the game and the rules and the, the, the way you move in a relationship was more indicative of what you wanted out of a relationship. And so now when you get back in the game, the game ain't the same. When you was in the game, all you was playing the game very well. You had all these different women. You had all these different dudes and you was just dating. You was just just having a good time and all was well when you was just having fun but now you want something different because you were exposed to greater so when you now are exposed to greater and you try to return to what was once comfortable it doesn't satisfy you like it used to and he's like man the game show has changed i can't do this no more i need to get into a relationship fast because i may drown out here these people crazy have you ever tried to enter the game when the game is no longer the same as you remember it have you ever tried to go back to a relationship that you had a long time ago when you were a certain type of individual and now you've grown but the other person hadn't and but you had a good time back then so you say oh I'm better now. Maybe we will be good together. And you get back and like, what the world is going on? This is craziness. I got to get up out of this. It's not the same. So for you to return is not going to do anything. So we've got to press forward and we've got to continue into understanding and applying the word of God because we've been exposed now once you have accepted that call again that call to discipleship that broad invitation and Jesus says come come see what I got come hear what I'm saying and you're exposed to it and you see things happen you see God moving and you try to go back because things are uncomfortable man I'm telling you it's not going to satisfy you so we now, where we want to be is different from where we ought to be. So here we're seeing this discussion of spiritual maturity. Progress. It's determined by your ability to take the information that you have and when tests come, to be able to use that information appropriately to make proper decisions. It's to be able to see a thing and saying, okay, this is probably going to happen. And based on the word of God, based on what's now in me, I would make this choice and I'm going to apply the word of God according to my understanding of the word of God. And now I'm going to allow God to handle the circumstance and watch what unfolds. See, that is where progress comes. That's how your faith is built up. That's how your understanding of God is built. That's how you actually move from called to chosen. So we see that you can never progress past your point of application. The next point is here that we see in the scripture is that many people here are not where they want to be simply because they haven't accepted the reality and the responsibility of where they ought to be. Okay, what are you saying? I'm saying many of us aren't where we want to be because they haven't accepted the responsibility and the reality of where you ought to be. When you come to Christ, when you come to, to God and establish that connection, sure, where you wanted to be was one point. But as you go through and navigate and make the choices of commitment and connection and graduate through the different levels of the calls that we have uh, we have described previously, where you want to be now changes 
and now where you want to be, it doesn't look like where you wanted to be before. You know, right now I'm past 35 and I didn't give up that dream of, of, of being successful and having, you know, millions of dollars or anything like that. But you know what? At that time, I wanted to retire and just sit on my butt and do nothing at by 35. But you know what? I couldn't sit on my butt if I tried to. Now I just have a passion to develop others, a passion to teach, a passion for people's lives to be transformed, a passion to be used. And God, I don't know what that looks like from a financial standpoint, but guess what? As time has gone on and as my desire of where I want to be has been altered through my pro progression through the different calls from commitment and connection with God, what's happened is where I wanted to be before didn't look like where I want to be now. And where I want to be now really far outweighs where I wanted to be before. Because where I want to be now is to be an experience, to experience more of his grace, his love, his mercy. And that just gives me so much joy and fulfillment. I don't know if I would have had joy with what I was talking about back in my 20s, but I sure do know I got it right now. And I know that I didn't have have it when I was talking in my 20s and I felt like having the money would give it to me. But guess what? I don't have the money right now and I got it anyway. Tell me that God cannot change where you want to be. And now as my where I want to be has changed, where I ought to be is of primary importance to me. God, show me where I ought to be in relation to where you're taking me. Where I want to be is where you're taking me. So God, that's where I want to be. So therefore, where I ought to be is always in alignment with where I want to be. So here we're seeing a difference that's taking place. There is a transition that goes as you go through the levels of the call. There is a transition that is taking place. See, his, see, 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 this, this, this message is really looking at three possible locations where you want to be, where you are now, and where you ought to be. See, I recognize where I am now ain't where I'm going to be, but I recognize now that where I'm going to be is where I want to be. And so therefore, where I ought to be, I'm going to rest in that. And that's where I am now. So here, as I'm moving forward, there's some progression and transition that's taking place, even in my mindset, even in my heart, as I'm going through the different calls here. We're talking about living the chosen life, going from called to chosen. Many are called, but few are chosen. So pastor, what, what are these transitions? Remember the four calls that I discussed at the beginning of this series. We have the broad invitation, the call to discipleship. Then we have the second call, which is a call of proximity. Come closer. This is a call of relationship, call of connection. Then we have the third one, which is the call to anoint. Okay, this is where the church is supposed to start out. Okay, the call to anoint. This is where you're holy and set apart for God's holy purposes. Okay, then we have the call to identify call of identification. This is where God identifies, not according to your attributes, but according to your potential and your purpose. And so here, you know, we have the four calls, but when we look at this, there's a transition. See, see, there's a transition. So there's a transition in my mindset and my growth and my maturity when I go from one to the other, when I go from one to two. OK, there's a transition because I'm going from one, a broad call to a more personalized call, a call of proximity. That means that God is wanting me to know him more. But that's also an opportunity where God shows how much he knows me. OK, and so we have a call of proximity. But here we have in level in the first half of this calls one and two. What's happening is that is a call according to your needs. OK, that is a call according to your needs. Levels one and two is a call according to your needs. OK, because the initially right when we were created in his image, we have been separated uh, by sin. And so therefore, there's initial call. I told you salvation, that call to discipleship was the floor. Right. That's not the end result. OK, we have to have that to have connection. So therefore, it is a call for according to your need to be connected to God. 
You have to be connected to the creator. You have to be connected to the source. You have to be connected to God. God is your strength. He is your refuge. He gives your life. The air that I breathe is based off of him. So therefore, I need to be connected to him. So one, the broad invitation is a call according to my needs. Now, when we look at even in the natural, the needs that we have, we have the needs of security. We have the needs to be understood. We have a need for, for, for belongingness. All of those things are according to my needs. So in call number two, the call of proximity is where we get our belongingness, is where we understand the uniqueness of who we are in God, is where we have that need for security. It's according to our needs. God is now calling us closer in proximity so that he can now have a relationship and a connection to us. Our need to be connected is fulfilled. Call number two is based on my needs. Now, call number three. Now your needs are met. Call number three is now according to the needs of the people, the needs of others. See, this is a oh man. You've got to listen to the message that I taught the series. What to expect when you're expecting, because I talked about the seed of God and how the seed addresses a need. So now the Call number three, where the church is supposed to start, right? But you have to be saved before you can start there. So call number three addresses the needs of others. One and two addresses my needs. Three and four addresses the needs of others. God meets my needs so that I can be used to meet the needs of others. God says, I shall supply all your need according to my riches and glory in Christ Jesus. And so therefore he meets my needs so I can now accept the call to be commissioned out to meet the needs of others. So here the call to anoint and set apart for his holy purposes are now I'm calling you for a particular role. This is when he called him them apostles. He says, you've been my disciples. Then now I'm going to call and anoint you and bless you as apostles so I can send you out to address the needs of others. So for you to live the chosen life, you've got to get over yourself. For you to live the chosen life, you've got to be assured that God is already meeting your needs. And as he's meeting your needs, you've now got to be willing and now got to be committed that based on your connection, you're going to go out and help meet others' needs. That God is going to use you to meet the others' needs. In the other series, I said, I am a promise to be a promise. Uh, I've been promised. I've been promised a promise so that I can be a promise to somebody else. And so God is going to meet your needs so that you can meet somebody else's need. So here in three and four, call to anoint and call to identity and purpose. Now your purpose is to go out and meet the needs of others. By now, you ought to be Teachers, you ought to be demonstrating this stuff. This is your responsibility. It is your obligation. It is not a desired characteristic. So he's saying, you don't have a choice if you are in the kingdom of God. If you are tied to me, this is why he's saying, look, look, you have, con you have commitment, but you don't have connection. If you have connection... I can now work through you. You can now go through this process and therefore you go from called to chosen. Many are called, few are chosen. In these calls, we see transition taking place. We see progression. We see maturity taking place. We see change. I thank God for the day that I accepted the broad invitation. I praise God for the day that I answered and made the choice to come closer with the call of proximity. I am honored to be called his servant and for him to call me so that he can anoint me for his holy purposes. And I am excited to be called and commissioned to go out to live out my purpose. Thank God. How do you feel when you answer the call? There's transition taking place. As I answer each call, I'm moving to another level, another level of intimacy, another level of relationship as I answer the call. But in the transition, 
there's transformation taking place. I told you, you are, your life will be transformed. You will be transformed. There's transformation in transition. And so as I move from two to three, from call of proximity to call of anointing, I'm thankful for the transition from where God addresses my needs to where he uses me to address the needs of others. People of God, I pray that this message has blessed you. I pray that you've gotten something out of this series. I'm so thankful for the opportunity to teach it. I'm so thankful for God tapping me and choosing me to deliver this word to you. Now, if this word has blessed you and you'd like to be a blessing to Northridge Church and the work that we're doing across the globe, there are several ways that you can provide tithes, give tithes, offering, or donations. And the first is through our website. Go to our website at www.thenorthbridge.org, www.thenorthbridge.org. Click on the word give, and your donations help us take this message of the kingdom all throughout the globe, across the world. Secondly, you can cash out us. That's dollar sign NBC Frisco, dollar sign NBC Frisco. Or you can text the word give to 972-866-7867, 972-866-7867. Now, please stay tuned because we have our weekly challenge. But in the meantime, as you're preparing your gifts, please state with me our giving statement. It states, my giving is an honor and not a burden. It is a seed that I sow and not a debt that I owe. May God bless it and honor it and multiply it for his kingdom. In the name of Jesus, amen. We thank you for your gifts. We thank you for supporting this ministry. Now, for your weekly challenge, let's look at our lives. And I want you to pick a point in your life previously. If you're in your 30s, pick a point in your 20s. If you're in your 40s, pick a point in your 30s. Pick a point at least 10 years ago and I want you to, from 10 years ago, I want you to say, where did you want to be when you were at that age? Okay? Now I want you to look at where you, your age now for today and say, where do you want to be? How do those two align? How are they different? Okay? Where is God taking you? Based on your understanding today, where is God taking you? And based on that, where should you be? Some of you will need to pray to God for revelation and illumination to the answer to these questions. And if you don't know right off hand, be like, God, please help me understand where you're taking me in my life. If you don't know, say, God, show me where I ought to be. Some of you may dis discern that, hey, you ought to be serving with particular ministry, you ought to be learning a particular skill, you ought to be strengthening yourself in certain areas that may be challenging, you ought to be trying to work with counselors to get over certain triggers that have happened in your past, you ought to be doing something, and, and understand where you ought to be versus, in, or in relation to, where God is taking you. Where you ought to be should not be where you wanted to be a decade ago. Where you ought to be is in relation to where God is taking you. And remember, where he's taking you, he's taking you to bless others. People of God, I pray this message has blessed you. I pray the weekly challenge helps you apply the principles and the word of God to your life. Until next time, be blessed. Welcome back. I hope you enjoyed today's message. Now, some of you may be asking yourself, how can I experience more love, more truth, more transformation, and more success in God? The first step is you must accept him into your life and give your life to him. Now, if you hadn't done that, or if you're not sure, all you have to do is repeat after me and say the simple prayer. Say, God, I recognize that I have lived a life apart from you and I no longer want to be apart from you. And God, 
I recognize the, the sacrifice that you've made by sending your son, Jesus Christ, to die for my sins. And so, God, I accept him as my Lord and Savior into my life. God, I welcome you into my life. Amen. If you've said those words, welcome to the fold. I, am, I thank you. I'm excited for you. And I just know that your life will never be the same. Now, there's some work because now you'll now get to be connected to God and understand his purpose for your life and your identity in him. Now, others may say, hey, pastor, I've done all of that, but I just need prayer. My life right now is a little uneasy and I just need someone to stand with me in prayer. Now, if that's you, we will stand with you in prayer. All you have to do is text the word prayer followed by your name to 972-787-1761. Text the word prayer followed by your name to 972-787-1761 and we will reach out to you directly and pray with you. Now others, you may say, hey, pastor, I need someone to stand with me and empower me and coach me along this journey. And that's what we're here for. That's exactly what a pastor is here for, to shepherd you along the process. And if you say, Pastor, I want you and Northbridge Church to be that family for me, we welcome you. It doesn't matter where you are. You can be here in Frisco, Texas, or you can be on the other side of the country. It doesn't matter where you are. All you have to do is text the word covering, followed by your name, to 972-787-1761. That's 972-787-1761. And we will walk that journey with you. I'm excited for you. Welcome to the fold. Welcome to the family. Welcome to the family of God. And I am so excited and I can't wait to see what God has in store for you. Be blessed.